Matthew chapter 6, we'll be, we're in the Lord's Prayer and the Sermon on the Mount, verses 9 through 13. And we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount in the context of the kingdom of God. And when Jesus came to, to preach, when he came to do ministry in the flesh, right before this sermon, we're told that he came saying that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel of God. He's sticking a flag in the ground. And so we are then to repent into that kingdom, away from the opposing kingdom, and repent toward his kingdom so that we would live out life in his kingdom. And we've been talking about the idea that this is war. And that the enemy wants us in many ways, not just to confront us with big bombs, but actually circumvent and go around and beat us down with psyops. And one of the strategies that the enemy would have was to cause us to forget that we're in a war at all. So we can just come to church and it can mean nothing. It's just a couple songs and a prayer. The guy's going to speak a little bit and then we're going to get out of here at 1230. But that's not at all what this is about. Paul talks about this life in the kingdom this way. This is Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's how Paul talks about the Christian life. This is a big deal. Now, I want to be careful because I can hammer in the fact that we're actually in a war and maybe we shouldn't be like hanging up our hammock while the, the bombs are going around, right? Well, I've been hammering that. Like, like it gets serious. Get in the foxhole. Put your helmet on. And I can emphasize that without reminding us that, you know what? We're supposed to do this with joy. There's actually joy in this kingdom life. There's actually peace in this fight. But it is a fight, and we need to pray. The beauty is it's not our fight. We're invited to fight for his kingdom and his glory, and he gives us this thing called prayer so that we can pray and speak to the commander whose fight this is. So it's natural and it's necessary for kingdom people to pray. And so we've been using this quote from John Piper. This is chapter two of Let the Nations Be Glad. Pick that book up. Read this chapter. It's awesome. He says this. He says, Prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief. If I'm going to tell you that we're in wartime and that we need to be fighting together, then I need to tell you that we need to pray. We need to pray to the commander for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief. If we don't pray, then we can't fight. And so Jesus, in this part of his sermon, he gives us an example of how not to be righteous. In chapter 6, it's part of, the, of Jesus' sermon, and he's going after the heart. He said, look, you're hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of the kingdom. Beware, watch your heart, that you don't work this good stuff out, this righteousness out, for the wrong reasons, for the approval of man. And so he, he, he says, he says don't, don't give to the needy like this. Then he says, don't pray like this, but like that. And he says, don't, don't fast like this, but like this. And that, that's kind of where we are in chapter 6. And so we're in that section where he says, he says, don't pray like that, pray like this. So let me just remind you a little bit of how he's described these things. First of all, he says, don't pray like the hypocrites. And we've been using this phrase, they made a good thing a bad thing by desiring the wrong thing and fighting for nothing. The hypocrites. They prayed, but they prayed wrong. They prayed for the wrong thing with the wrong heart. They prayed for their own glory, not God's. They made a good thing, a bad thing, by desiring the wrong thing and fighting for nothing. 
And then he goes on in verses seven through eight. He says, don't be like the Gentiles. Don't be like the pagans. Don't be like the unbelievers. You know what they did? They missed a good thing by desiring a bad thing because they know nothing. He said, don't be like the pagans who don't even know God. And so they're going to pray like they don't know God. They're going to try to manipulate God and tell them, tell him what they need. And then they're going to manipulate him to give him those things. And it's just useless. He says, don't be like that. He says, he says like this. He says, pray like this then. Be like followers of Christ. Verses 9 through 13. This is the Lord's prayer. He says, pray like followers of Christ who know the good king. Who treasure the right thing for the glory of the true king. See, followers of Christ, they know the good king. And they treasure the good king's glory. That's what they know. So pray like this, he says. So verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus says, pray then like this. He's not giving us like, here's the words that you say. Remember, he's getting to the heart in his sermon. He's always getting to the heart of righteousness. Have this heart when you pray. Pray like this, not pray this. And he gives us six petitions. He says this. He says, our Father in heaven. That's kind of like his introduction, right? Our Father in heaven. I've I've thought about that so much since I've studied it. So thank you for letting me study it so I could think about it. It's our father, father, relationship. Us together have a relationship, sons and daughters, with the father. There's affection there. In heaven, there's transcendence there. He perfectly marries the two. Transcendent relationship blowing all of the Jews' minds, blowing all of our minds. That's what we have. That's who we're praying to. Our father in heaven. And so once that's established, then our focus turns to our Father's glory, His name, His kingdom, His will. This is the primary concern of believers, that He would be made much of, that His kingdom would come, and that His will would be done on this earth as it is in heaven And from that understanding, that overarching desire of of his kingdom to come, his righteousness, his will to be here, now I get to turn my eyes onto man's needs. What do I need? It's all about his kingdom. But does that mean that where I live every day doesn't matter? No, according to Jesus, not at all. We now get to turn to man's needs directly directly. Specifically, our daily food, our sins, and our temptations. And that's where we are today. So let's just break this down a little bit. Just Let's just walk through and, 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 and pull out of this. Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. So quick explanation. That word daily is a rarely used word. In fact, it's, it's just found in this prayer, which I thought was at least interesting. And what he's getting to here is that it, it's just this, it's, it's, it is what it says, right? It's, it's this, this, there's a sense of my daily need. There's a sense that if I ask in the morning for what I need for the day, I'm asking for the rest of the day. If I'm asking for what I need in the evening, I'm asking for what I need tomorrow. And this would sing in the ears of those who would live Paycheck to paycheck, but their paycheck is every day. Every day. They're just, they're just making enough so that they can pay for tomorrow. They're in a, they're in a, a rural society, a lot like Guadalupe. It's an agrarian, they call it. it just, like, if the crop fails, then they're in trouble. If it doesn't come about, then they don't have what they need. And so Jesus says, Pray. To give us today our daily bread. 
And this prayer then becomes a prayer of dependence, doesn't it? It's just, it's like, oh yeah, I knew that. But what does he say? Pray this way. Pray with daily dependence on your mind. Who are we depending on? The Father that we know. We're like three weeks from that part of the sermon. But he's like three sentences away. We're praying and depending on the Father that we know. And what do we know about this Father? That he knows our need. That he's going to give us our basic needs. So... Give us this day. Our daily bread becomes a prayer of my own dependence on the one that I know. Second to that, it points to the fact that God is not only a provider, but he's good. God is not only a provider, but he's good. Our Father in heaven, you are good and you know my needs. And I know that if I pray to you, you're going to give me everything that I need. James writes this letter, writes his letter to these people that are scattered and they're in trials. And he says this, he says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights. You know what that phrase means, Father of lights? our Father in heaven. He says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God himself is the ultimate source of every good. God himself is the ultimate source of our food and our clothing and our work and our leisure and our strength and our intellect and all of our stuff. God is good, and he gives us good things. So how might we take that truth and apply it to our lives? Well, I I heard a a guy say, use this phrase. He says, says, you know what? In America, in the suburbs specifically, our toy boxes are full. And I went, oh, that's good. Our toy boxes are full. God fills our toy box. But we're just like all of the kids we know who are focused on all the toys they don't have in their toy box. In our flesh, we know that God gives us what we need, but we shake our puny little fists at God in rebellion. And we cry and we complain and we grumble because we don't have what we want. And as we're shaking our fists, we know, Christians, we know that he has every right to withdraw everything that we have. And he would be fair, but he doesn't. He doesn't. See, our shaking our puny little fist is not a fruit of the Spirit. it's, It's the opposite. We're not poor in spirit before a holy God, lacking in all things. We're not poor in spirit at all. We're proud and we insult our Father. We take his gifts for granted. And when our gifts dry up, we complain We're like a teenager. Teenagers. We're just like you. Where we have so much in our lives, right? And what do we say to our parents? I don't have this. And I don't have that. And my friends have this. And I don't have that. And I hate you. And you hate me. Right? And we go, that's... that's, But look at your life. It's so absurd. I was watching the Netflix series called Receiver, and it's about these athletes. You know, they got a ton of money, and they're having a birthday party for the four-year-old. And the mom is like, all I want her to do is have a normal life. Well, she has a football player's salary birthday party. I'm like, I want a birthday party like that. And all these friends are coming in, and they got this big old spread for a four-year-old, and they got all these games, and they got these, like, huge stuffed animals. I mean, it's, it was an extravaganza, and all I want... All I want is for her to have a normal life. 
We kind of giggle at that. We go, yeah, me too. But we have the same attitude. We do. It's just the way that we work these things out because our toy boxes are full. We're used to a full toy box. I think this about my granddaughter. It's her birthday coming up. You listening? Anyway, it's her birthday coming up. She has lots of stuff. Am I, are you guys with me on that? She has like plenty of things. She, has, she, she even has a toy box, I think. I don't know what to get her because she already has all the stuff. What else does she need? Well, that's how our toy boxes are in our life. My fear for, for getting another toy is that she'll just be spoiled, right? That she'll be spoiled and not appreciate what she has. Why do I fear that for her? Because I see it in us. I see it in me. See, there's this curse of blessing that we need to be aware of. There's a temptation to take our blessing and allow it to get in the way of being grateful for what God has given us because he covers every need that we have. Give us this day our daily bread. See, in this trial of blessing, I think we sadly fail. Our complaints, and let me mean, I'm not trying to be like uh, vague here. Every time you complain and grumble and gripe and whine, whether, it's, whether you can make a case for it or not, you're shaking your puny little fist at God. And you know what? I'm shaking my fist at God this morning. But here's the good news. When I realize that that's sin and unbelief, the good news is that I can confess it as sin. That's why we practice confession every morning on Sunday. So that we would exercise the good news and confess our unbelief that God is good. And not just stop at confession, but actually repent, where we turn our backs on that unbelief and we believe that he is good, and then we take steps to do that. Like, it's very practical. Okay, it's not just like, mm, I'm going to muster up some energy here. What practically can we do? So let me offer you a practical step of repentance. Confess your unbelief. See it for what it is. That's sin. So how do I not do that? I had a guy tell me, a, a, a good friend of mine, and man, this blew me away. This is like a year ago. He's like, he's like, watch yourself. And how many times you say, I need? He said, change that to I want. He said, it'll blow you away. And guess what it did? Like, I'm thinking about that all the time. I don't need that, but I want that. I don't need that, but I want that. Like, let me, let me give you like an example. So I was uh, talking to um, Jim Cunningham this morning. He and, he and Michelle are, they're actually in the hospital because she has a pain in her leg. They're not like worried about it. They don't know what it is. And so they're checking it all out, right? And so we're talking. They're like, and because they're Jim and Michelle, they're like, how are you? And I go like this. I go, well, I need a vacation, I'm going, I'm going to go to the Northwest tomorrow and I'm going to be coming back Saturday and I need it. That's this morning on the way here. I need it. Do I need it? No, but I want it. Would it be a good thing? Yes. So it might be a good desire. But see, if I have that in my mind that I need this, life and death need, what if God says, no, I'm going to take that away from you. How am I going to respond? See, this kind of repentance in our thinking is a simple shift that changes our expectations. And this change in our expectations causes us to be thankful for what we have. God, I desire a vacation. It would be helpful to have a vacation. But I don't need that vacation. And you're going to give me a vacation? And I don't even need it, but I desire it. I mean, you're going to give me my desires? What does that engender in my heart? What does that form in my heart? A heart of gratitude. 
A heart that says it's important that I would ask God to give us this day our daily bread because I know he's a good God who gives me what I need. I got another one before we move on. Another reflection on that. When we say that God is good, it means that our loving Father gives us what is very best for us. When we say that God is good, we mean that our loving Father gives us what is very best for us. And what's the very best for us? Is it a vacation? Is it another toy in our toy box? Is it a hobby? Is it a connection? What is it that's very best for us? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His will is that we would be saved and that we would be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. And he will do whatever is best for us, which means he will do whatever it takes to transform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. We have to remember that in our minds because oftentimes we think what is good is what's most comfortable, what's easiest. If that was the case, then Jesus wouldn't say this, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Count it joy when you're persecuted. Why? Because this gives you an opportunity to reveal that God is good and he's at work in your heart in such a way that you can take all of these circumstances and you can respond in a mind-blowing way and rejoice. See, God causes and allows things to happen in our life because he loves us. And I stop and I, I, I want to highlight that reality for this reason. Because I wonder that when he exercises his sovereign love in this way, how do we respond? How do you respond? See, the answer to that question determines what kind of people we are. Are we resilient and meek? Do you see where the strength comes in? Like, this is what I'm thinking right now. I'm thinking, okay, so we are before God in his presence, practicing that even now this morning, and we see that he is holy. Great is our God. We see that, and we see like, oh, I'm in his presence. He's great. I shouldn't be here. Look how far I lack, so I mourn over my sin. I get to see it. That's why I can confess. But I don't, I don't stop at mourning over my sin, and like my, my life is a dirge. God, I'm such a sinner. What happens? That truth, that reality causes me to be meek. So I'm humble. And I'm strong all at the same time. And that makes me resilient. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? This world, this culture, our culture needs resilient people. Not, I, not like tough, aggressive, in-your-face people. But like tough, purposeful, confident, bold people who know that this life is about the king and his kingdom. And that's the direct opposite of being vulnerable and weak. Are we resilient and meek, or are we vulnerable and weak? I had to get that. You know I had to get that rhyme in there. See, when difficult times descend upon us, will we, will we remain? Will we remain in the faith? Will we be a light in the darkness? Will we be... Salt in a decaying world. When difficult times descend upon us, will we remain? Where will our refuge come from? Revelation asks this question. In the midst of all of this tribulation, who can stand? And the answer is this. Those who remain in his word and are trained to respond with this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. All right, let's move on. Chapter, or verse 12. Second, uh, this is the, the fifth petition. 
of his prayer. He says, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then he, did you, I kept this 14 and 15 here. We're like, we're doing 9 through 13. Did you notice I put that on there? We're going to come back to that. But it kind of helps us figure out what this is. So sandwiched in between there is verse 13, lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we're going to come back to this, this idea of forgiveness next week simply because Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, talks about forgiveness. And in his prayer, forgiveness makes the cut. And not only that, but he expands on it. So we're going to expand on it as well. But the, the first question I have then is, so let me read this again. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So we're going to break that down. But let me ask you this question. You have this same question in your mind? Does this mean that I forgive others so that God will forgive me? Does this mean that I forgive others so that God will forgive me? When I first read it, it sounds that way. And so we're going to, to make the case for what Jesus really means there. Now, I want to make sure that, that we have connected already, just to, as a, a side that I think is helpful, that we would forgive our debts. That's trespasses and sins, right? So when somebody owes us, they've sinned against us, that we would forgive them just as he has forgiven what we owe him. Okay? So let me ask the question again. Does this mean that I forgive others so that God will forgive me? And the answer is no. What Jesus is teaching here is for us to pray for repentance and belief into his forgiveness for us. I'm going to say that again. This is what he's saying here. He's saying, repent and believe into my forgiveness for you. Turn your Bibles, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to read this fairly quickly. Make a comment, and then we're going to move on, knowing that we're going to come back to this idea of forgiveness next week. Matthew 18, starting in verse 23, all the way through 35. If you've been around church very long, you've heard this as uh, called the, the parable of the unforgiving servant. So this is Jesus telling the story. So he would tell this story so that we get an understanding of the kingdom might be relevant to this Sermon on the Mount that's all about the kingdom. He says, verse 24, or 23, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Their debts. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. The text tells us here he couldn't pay it off. But that was his cry. Verse 27, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. And so his fellow servants fell down and or his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, "Have patience with me and I will pay you." And he refused, and he went and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and they reported to their master all that had taken place. Verse 32, then his master summoned him and said to him, "You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me." And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Shouldn't that be your response? So also my heavenly Father will do to you, to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. 
His whole point here in this parable is that the forgiven servant's unforgiving spirit bears strong witness to the fact that he has never believed, that he's never repented, that he took the forgiveness of God, of the, of the master specifically, and he just chucked it away, and it showed in his life by his lack of forgiveness toward other people. That's what Jesus is saying here. So we reflect on that this way. What Jesus is saying is that the greatest display of the kingdom citizen is how they respond in the face of being sinned against. Blessed are the persecuted. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Respond in a way that reveals that you've believed into what Christ has done on the cross to forgive you your sins. When you are sinned against Forgive the offender and prove yourself a repentant believer. Now, fortunately for us, we don't have very many opportunities to forgive each other. So we don't have to worry about it. No. You know why we got to pray this way? Because we're sinners. You know what sinners do? They sin. They rebel against God and they offend God each other. I sin against you. You sin against me. The good news is that we have a way to deal with it. It's called forgiveness. See, when we don't forgive from the heart, we're protecting our own kingdom. When we don't forgive from the heart, I'm talking from the heart because sometimes we don't know if somebody's offended and we should forgive, et cetera, et cetera. We need to know those things. And we'll talk about that. But, but Randy actually talked a lot about that. But if we don't forgive from the heart, what that means is that we're defending and protecting our own kingdom. It's all about our life and our glory. We are central. And what did we just get done praying? Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. In other words, you make me so that I can be all about your kingdom and your will and make much of your name. That's what a Christian does. That's the heart of a Christian. And if we have that heart where we're protecting our kingdom, then we're going to lose everything. But if we have a heart that desires his kingdom to come, and his will to be done, then we are simply going to forgive because that's what we do in his kingdom. And when we do that, we're taking up the cross. It gets real practical, doesn't it? It's not like, I'm going to take, I don't know, have a cross. Yeah, you do. When people offend you, take up his cross. Take up his kingdom. Forgive, follow him. And guess what? You will gain Everything. Oh, man, that's good news. All right. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Verse 13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. First question, and I read this, I'm like, I ask this question. I go, well, why? Why should we have to ask God not to lead us? Doesn't that sound weird? Like, you don't, lead. I thought you were the one, the good one. So, so I'm going to have to ask you, why should we have, have to ask God not to lead us into temptation? Why don't we just say, keep us from temptation? It's, might he lead us into temptation? Well, fortunately, I had time to read. <laughs> D.A. Carson was really helpful with this. He says this. He says, this is, a, this is an identifiable figure of speech. And it emphasizes something by negating the contrary. That's what's happening. That's what Jesus is using here. He's negating the contrary and emphasizing the positive. It'd be like me me saying, so so, uh, Andrew, I need some information from you. Don't be pulling my leg. Don't pull my leg on this. What am I saying? Tell me the truth. And I'm kind of doing it in a dramatic way where I'm emphasizing you. Don't mess around here. You tell me the truth later. Okay, we'll talk about this later. So it's like that. 
So he's saying this. He's saying, lead us not into temptation. And he's forcefully emphasizing, lead us away from temptation. Lead us away from temptation and into righteousness, into situations where far from being tempted, that we will be protected and therefore be kept righteous. Do you see that's, that's the emphasis here? Then we will be delivered from the evil one. So what do we do with that? Well, just as we depend on God for our physical sustenance and everything that we need, we also depend on him for righteousness. See, we, 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 we depend on him for the heart stuff, for moral triumph, for spiritual victory. We don't depend on ourselves for that. See, to fail at the, this pointed dependence... When we, when we try to do it ourselves and we don't depend on him and, and we're trying to be independent, it means that we don't believe that God is gracious. And we've already failed. There's no way we can win by ourselves. See, our effort at independence is always an effort to refuse the reality of our position as creatures dependent upon our Creator. It means that when we shake our puny little fists and we complain that we've forgotten who we are before our creator. And when we try to fix things ourselves, even our moral goodness, even our affections, and we try to do that ourselves, then we're shaking our puny little fists and we've forgotten who gives us everything that we need spiritually. That's the very reason that we are blessed when we mourn over our sin. As Christians continuously changing to be more like Christ, we grow in our awareness and our sense of our own sinfulness. See, that's the, the, like, don't get this wrong. As we grow in Christ, it doesn't mean we're less sinners. In fact, it means that we see the depth of our sin deeper and deeper and more clearly and more clearly and more clearly. And that's good news because we're quicker then to go to the one that we depend upon to rejoice. See, I, I, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes. You're listening to me. Okay, yeah, I'm a, I'm a terrible sinner. I'm, yeah, I see that. I saw it this morning. I'm shaking my little fist. Now I got two fists up, you know. If I had a third fist, I'd be shaking that one. That's me. That's me, JB. That's me. That's me. That's me. But then we're going, yeah, but I'm kind of good. I mean, I loved my wife this last week, didn't I? I mean, I made a phone call. I called Jim and Michelle at the hospital. Like, what did, did, didn't I do something good? Yeah, I did something good. But here's what I know. That without God, that doesn't matter, and I wouldn't do it. Now I'm thankful for any good thing that I have in my life is from him, and he gives it to me freely. My toy box is full, and so I'm grateful. See, it's important that we recognize the deceptiveness of our own hearts. It's good that we recognize the malicious cunning of the evil one in this war so that we will fervently request from our Heavenly Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And last thing is this. The gospel believed in this way makes for a healthy church. Oh, you got to say that. You're the pastor. You're right. I got to say it because I'm your pastor. And we're a church. See, I'm convinced, I'm convinced of this in this passage specifically, that the fact that the plea to avoid temptation, where's it sandwiched between? The petition concerning forgiveness and then Jesus' commentary on it. I think what that means is that it suggests that the temptation that primarily, primarily that is before us, that is in, in Christ's view here, is the temptation to be bitter. It's the temptation to be bitter, to maintain a veer of religion, 
without a concern for the heart of the gospel. To be nice, not real. Seems I've had several discussions recently that are pointed at this whole point here, Grace Church. We need to understand the gospel truth in such a way that we would not just settle for nice behavior and miss the heart. We can get through conflict. I'm talking about relational conflict between people in this room. Same families. All over the place. We can get through that. But what we are tempted to do is to get through it churchily, not gospelly. That we would, just, we would just, on the surface, as long as everything's fine, we can just march forward. And Jesus is saying, no. I'm getting to the heart on this prayer. You pray like this so that you will do it gospelly. This, this suits the whole theme of this whole part of his sermon. Don't work out your righteousness for the approval of man in front of others but for the audience of God. Do it from the heart. Yeah, Jamie, I will. That's hard. Yeah. And you know what? If you are pursuing your own glory, you're going to submit. You're going to, I mean, you're just going to, you're going to, you're going to like roll over like a puppy. Like it's too hard and uncomfortable and I don't like it. We're weak, not meek. This truth and the skill of forgiving others with the heart of God's love will make us a healthy church. That's why next week we're going to come back to verses 12 through 14. And we're going to learn how Jesus teaches us to be salt and light in a decaying and dark world. Let's pray. Father God, we are again grateful that you don't just leave us to ourselves and let us kind of work out the behavior in our lives so that we might be nice and acceptable at church, but Lord, that you, that you are constantly unveiling our own sin and our own self-preservation. And not just unveiling and exposing, but replacing with good news. Our Father in heaven, Help us to make much of your name. Help us to hunger and to thirst for your kingdom and your will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And let us rest in our knowledge of you, that you're good. Let us rest in the skill and the tools that you give us so that we can make much of you at the heart level. And so, Lord, I just ask that you, as, that you would just move in us as a church, that you would have your hand on us as a church. And that, Lord, that we wouldn't pursue life churchily, but that, Lord, that we would pursue it gospelly knowing the whole time, Lord, that that's your work. So do that work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.